Doesn't it drive you crazy when somebody answers your question with a question? I had a professor once in seminary who used to do that incessantly. Each and every time we would ask a, a deeply sincere, um, a truly profound question of faith, he would respond by saying, why do you ask? It was infuriating. Obviously, we were asking because we wanted to know the answer. At first, I thought my professor was doing this because he needed to buy time. He needed time to think of a good answer. Then I started to wonder if maybe he was just toying with us. Maybe he did just want to drive us crazy. Finally, I concluded that he must be doing this as some kind of teaching technique, showing us that, that our, our questions of faith can't be reduced to, to simple answers. Faith is just too paradoxical and mysterious. But one day, when one of my classmates asked a heartfelt question, it became obvious what my professor was up to, and it was absolute genius. That day, innocently enough, my classmate asked, what happens to non-Christians when they die? Predictably, my professor responded by asking, why do you ask? <laughs> Frustrated, my classmate said, because I want to know, plain and simple. But my professor wouldn't let it go. He kept asking, yes, but why do you ask? My classmate, getting more and more adamant, said, because I want to know. Can't you just give me an answer? It started to get really tense and uncomfortable in that room. In fact, so much so that a bunch of us started to take my classmate's side and demand from our professor that he just give him the answer that he's looking for. But like a dog with a bone, my professor kept persisting in his question until finally my classmate broke. And in an outburst of emotion, he said, I want to know because my mother's not a Christian. She's not a believer. I want to know what happens to her. Are you happy? There. That's why I want to know. See, what my professor realized and brilliantly so is that with this question about can non-Christians be saved, as with many other questions of faith, it's not a detached question. It's not like we're simply curious for an answer or we desire to know the cosmic order of things. It's not a purely philosophical question. No, it's a deeply personal one. When we ask this question, we usually have someone in mind, someone that, who we love dearly, someone we can't imagine spending eternity without, someone we can't fathom a loving God rejecting forever. So what does happen to people like my classmate's mother, somebody who refuses to believe in Christ? As I made very clear in last week's blog, the only way anybody can be saved is through faith in Christ. It's only through Him, through what He's done on the cross, that anybody can be saved. But as I also made clear, because we know his character, because he's revealed it so clearly, we can also safely say that he would never reject anybody who would ultimately want him to be their Lord and Savior. And only he can judge that. The, the ultimate uh, disposition of a person's heart, the ultimate desire of their heart, is only something that God can know. But what Jesus has made very clear is how he makes that judgment. In that famous verse, John 3, 16, that, that everybody knows, where, where God lays out his all-encompassing, universal, salvific will so beautifully, where it says that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that anybody who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. In, in that passage, Jesus then goes on to say a few verses later that some people will reject him because when he, the light, comes into the world, they will prefer the darkness. They will prefer to live their lives their own way. They will prefer to be the Lord of their own lives. Ultimately, God will give them their heart's desire. Of course, the ever-present danger is that we are all, in all, all of us, inclined to want to be the Lord of our own lives. We are inclined to want to do things our own Way. We don't want anybody, including God, telling us how to live our lives. And it's only when we surrender our lives to Christ through a conscious act of faith that we can break that addiction to self, that, that we, can, we can break that incessant need to be the captain of our own souls. That's why it's so urgent that we make a conscious act of faith in Christ. That's the only way anybody can be certain that they are saved. And anyone who refuses to do that, who refuses to believe in Christ it is putting themselves in a position of grave danger of rejecting God, potentially, eternally. So what if there's somebody like my, my classmate, uh, classmate's mother, somebody in your life who you're worried about 
being saved. Here's what you need to know. No matter how much you love them, God loves them infinitely more. No matter how much you desire that they be saved, God desires that infinitely more. And no matter what they ultimately choose, whether to make Him their Lord and Savior or not, to believe in Him or not, God will give them their heart's desire. And if your heart's desire is for Him, for Him to be your Lord and your Savior, He will give you infinitely more love than you can ever begin to imagine. So is there somebody in your life that you're worried about being saved? How do you deal with that? Go to the Contact EJ page of the Raising Jesus website and let me know. Um, you can leave any other questions or comments there as well. I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you haven't had a chance to already, please like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, thank you to all of you for all the ongoing support you've been giving me.